from the heart of where innovation, money, and power collide. In Silicon Valley and beyond, this is Bloomberg Technology with Emily Chang. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco, and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up in the next hour, President Biden arrives in Brussels ahead of a meeting with allies on the war in Ukraine, including a NATO summit. We will break down what to expect from this trip to Europe. Plus, new details on the hacking group behind the Okta breach, why they've been called laughably bad, even as they've managed to infiltrate so many large-scale tech companies. And Moderna says its COVID vaccine produced a strong immune response in kids under age six, but it's only modestly effective against Omicron. More on that later this hour. We'll get to all of this in a moment, but first U.S. stocks declining and the S&P 500 falling for just the second time in seven sessions. Our Ed Ludlow has more on the markets today. Ed. Yeah, there's definitely a lack of consistency, at least in the terms of the direction of travel in equity markets. See the Nasdaq 100, very technology heavy index, down 1.5% on Wednesday after a pretty significant gain on Tuesday. If there was outsized declines, it was certainly in semiconductors. You see that in the Philadelphia Semiconductor Index or SOX down 2.5%. That's what we see it yields on the Treasuries easing. You see the benchmark 10 year yield down by about nine basis points below 2.3%. If there's one sustained area of momentum, certainly in oil, West uh, Texas Intermediate Crude WTI up towards $114 a barrel. And there's real concern as it relates to the conflict in Ukraine about ongoing disruption with supply. You wonder how much of Biden's trip will focus on energy markets while he's talking with world leaders. Of course, we're also in the depths of earnings season M and Adobe was a really interesting one reported on Tuesday. But you see a pretty big market reaction on Wednesday down around 9% if we bring up the next board. That's the biggest drop since mid-December. They gave an outlook for the current period, which basically showed that competition's creeping in for their design software and they're not looking as hot as perhaps they might have done. You see they're down 9.3% on Wednesday. Also a really interesting area, you and I are going to talk about this a lot later in the show, is Chinese companies listed in the US. China stock, see Tencent down 5%. It recorded single digit growth for the first time since listing in 2004. And executives basically said the era of hard and fast growth is over. We are going to comply with this Chinese crackdown. That stock down 5% in New York on Wednesday. But other US listed Chinese tech companies actually faring much better. You look at the Nasdaq Golden Dragon Index. Over the last seven sessions, it's up 50%, 50% from a 2013 low. As concerns start to ease about that regulatory crampdown we've seen in China, perhaps the authorities there being more supportive of the technology sector in weeks to come, especially in light of a big market decline in terms of uh, Chinese tech companies. And finally, you've talked about it at the top of the show. I know you've been paying real close attention to this. Okta. I'm not really sure what happened, but the stock falls 10% on Wednesday. That's the biggest drop since November 2018. So that's a significant decline. The only real news of the last 12 hours or so is the company coming out and saying that only 2.5% of its customer base, around 366 customers, was impacted by this potential breach. But a really severe drop. You see that? Look after what we saw was pretty much a muted fall on Tuesday. Right, and there's been slow and some conflicting reporting about what actually happened there. Right. We're going to talk about that a bit more later in the show. Thank you, Ed. President Biden now in Brussels, set to meet with European leaders and attend an emergency NATO summit. The goal to show that the world is united against Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Bloomberg's political news director, Jody Schneider, with us now. Jody, what are we expecting from this trip? What does President Biden want to convey? Yeah, Emily, he wants, there's several main messages to look for from President Biden uh, now that he's in Brussels. One will be unity, that NATO and, uh, and the European allies and the U.S. and the U.K. are united in their denunciation of Vladimir Putin and his invasion of Ukraine and that they are doing what they can to try to stop it from going any further and to stop him uh, from, from uh, you know, anything, any gains he can make there and to punish him for this. Uh, Biden also wants to show solidarity with the European countries that are taking in so far millions of refugees from Ukraine, more than 3.3 million 
uh, Ukrainians have left their country for neighboring countries. More than 10 million have left their homes. Uh, obviously, some staying in Ukraine, but they have they have had to leave their homes and their communities. And so President Biden wants to make that clear. Uh, that the U.S. supports and, and empathizes with this, what will be a growing refugee crisis. Uh, thirdly, he wants to make the case for more sanctions. The U.S. has uh, had the toughest sanctions on oil because the U.S., frankly, uh, imports the least amount of crude oil and petroleum products from Russia, European countries in a much di more different situation. But the U.S. wants to push them to do more on sanctions. So those will be the three messages you can look for from the U.S. president. Well, and how could we see the U.S. step up sanctions and put pressure on Europe to step up sanctions? Yeah, so the U.S. has already, you know, gone a, a, a long way towards sanctioning uh, both uh, the oligarchs in uh, Russia and uh, th done things like, you know, ban the import of uh, Russian oil or Russian uh, crude oil to the U.S. However, they're taking more steps. And uh, the national security advisor, Jake Sullivan, said today that President Biden tomorrow at that summit and on Friday will be announcing even more sanctions against oligarchs, against individuals, as well as companies and other entities. So the U.S. is trying to double down even more on those sanctions, even as Vladimir Putin continues to criticize them. And we will be seeing more, uh, I think we will be seeing at least more verbal um, uh, accusations made against Russia. President Biden, before he got on the plane, when he was talking to reporters, before he got on Air Force One uh, earlier today, said that he would not be surprised if Vladimir Putin was to use chemical weapons in Ukraine. So there will be a lot of warnings as well as talk about sanctions. All right. Bloomberg's Jody Schneider, thank you for that update. We'll continue to follow the president's trip in Europe. Meantime, Instacart is launching a platform of services to sell to supermarkets, including 15-minute delivery for grocery retailers and building warehouses to store products and manage picking, packing, and delivery for supermarkets, a move that cements the company's turn into enterprise services. Under new CEO Fiji Simo, Instacart has been making multiple moves to strengthen the company's relationship with grocers as opposed to just consumers. Coming up, they claimed to have hacked some of the biggest names in tech. We've got the latest on Lapsus and how they've managed to breach so many large-scale tech companies despite being described as laughable. That is next. This is Bloomberg. The latest now on the evolving Okta breach, the identity management company that many businesses use as a top line of cyber defense. The group behind the breach calls itself Lapsus, and Bloomberg reports it has a murky background. For more, I'm joined by Bloomberg's Jack Gillum, who reports on cybersecurity for us. So, Jack, talk to us about what we've learned about Lapsus in the last 24 hours. We've heard laughable. We've heard the word murky. Who are they? So this is a group, Emily, that uh, has sort of breached, or has sort of risen up in the last year or two, according to certain experts that we've spoken with. Um, they've made bigger splashes in the last few months. They operate on Telegram channels, uh, which we might use to communicate with folks, but they use it to actually, uh, you know, brag about what they've been able to hack. Um, they're kind of an interesting group. Normally, when we think of these groups, we think of folks, uh, ransomware actors, who take our data and encrypt it and will offer to unlock it for us if we give them, you know, some sort of money in exchange. Um, these folks instead will just release the data. Um, now, you know, we've talked about them being sort of laughably bad. That was one expert we, we spoke to who studies this kind of stuff. Um, but, you know, just like a broken clock is right twice a day, I mean, even idiots, he said, can do really bad things. Uh, in this case, they apparently had released the source code, uh, some source code of Bing, which is Microsoft's uh, signature search engine, uh, their mapping platform, their voice recognition software. Um, so, you know, even if they are, they, they might be, you know, kids, they might be amateurs, they might not be nation state hackers, you know, given the right tools and opportunities, they could be pretty dangerous. Right. So they've hit Microsoft, as you say. They've been targeting crypto. And of course, this Okta breach. Let's dig into what exactly happened with Okta, because Okta says the company itself was not breached, but due to a breach of a third party, 
366 Okta customers were compromised. How serious is this and what does that actually mean? So to start from the beginning, Okta is what's called an identity management platform. That's just a fancy way of having a central place where you can log in, you know, put in your username and password. We all do it for our jobs, um, you know, where you just have to put in your credentials, your two-factor authentication once to get access to all sorts of things. So that essentially is like a, a mainline, uh, you know, authentication to get into, say, a company web portal, um, to get into a, a software developer's backend, you name it. Now, you know, it's only, as the company says, 2.5%, but that's still hundreds of companies, you know, as you mentioned, 366. And while we need to be careful here and appreciate that this investigation is, is ongoing, you know, the details are slowly com coming out and we're understanding them, you know, at worst case scenario here, these attackers could get access to these victims' networks. So even though Okta may in and of itself not have been breached, if these attackers were able to get sort of get into that authentication stream, you know, be able to get into a, a, a one of their clients' networks, they could pull out all sorts of data. We don't know the extent of that yet, but I think that's going to be the big question as we go forward here. So it does sound pretty serious indeed. And just to underscore this, you said Lapsus is not a nation state tied hacking group. Does that mean this has no relation to potential Russian cyber attacks or the chaos going on in cyberspace right now as a result of Russia's invasion of Ukraine? It, it might not be, Emily, but we also need to realize, and this is you know, to follow up on the you know, very, uh, spe not specific, but very repeated warnings by the U.S. government and others that, you know, Russia is looking for opportunities, they say, to access major companies and, and their networks in order to bring them down, uh, especially critical utilities. Uh, we saw Ann Neuberger, um, the senior U.S. official in charge of cyber, um, who made a very public plea about companies updating their security, adding this what's called two-factor authentication. So you might have a group of, you know, uh, a loose group of folks who are trying to uh, infiltrate companies and steal their data, but these two things aren't mutually exclusive. You still have what the government is calling this persistent threat of, of Russian nation states, um, and that companies need to do more in order to improve their security and keep their, themselves and their customers safe. All right, Bloomberg's Jack Gillum, thanks for the additional details there. I do want to continue thanks, this somebody. conversation on cybersecurity and bringing Kieran Martin. He is the former CEO of the UK's National Cybersecurity Center. He is also the managing director at Paladin Capital. Kieran, thank you so much for joining us. You know, so far it seems we have seen a dearth of cyber attacks from Russian would-be attackers since the war has started. Would you agree, and why is that? Well, thank you, Emily, for having me on. I think saying there's a dearth of attacks might be taking it a little bit far. There have been some quite important hacks. There was the hack of the Viasat satellite network, which according to the Ukrainian Cybersecurity Agency caused some quite serious disruption to communications. But that's the sort of thing we've seen from Russia before against Ukraine since hostilities started, not on February 24, but in 2014 with the annexation of Crimea. And I think a lot of people would have expected a serious intensification of that, and that hasn't happened yet. Why might that be? Well, it may be that the Russian cyber hackers weren't ready, like a lot of the Russian forces, maybe they weren't told. And unlike some military operations, say flying a bombing squad uh, over a city, um, a sophisticated hack of a power grid of internet infrastructure actually takes a very long time to plan. It takes a lot of time, skill, resources, and a bit of luck. You have to remain undetected. So maybe they weren't ready. Um, also, frankly, when you're in a state of full-scale war, blowing something up is... It's easier for the invader than doing a sophisticated cyber attack. So there are all sorts of reasons, but I think the sort of cyber war that we feared hasn't happened yet, but we're still in this crisis. And I think the president was right to sign the alarm the other night about what might happen because we need to be prepared. So how serious then would you say the threat is of Russian cyber attacks, given so many of their resources have been focused on this physical invasion thus far? And if these cyber attacks do happen, how damaging could they be? So it depends on your starting point. If you subscribe to a kind of Hollywood version of cyber war where everything goes off at once and normal life is completely blown apart, I don't think that's realistic. That's very hard to do and it's extremely hard to do at scale. 
Um, and obviously, if you're in Ukraine, you're in fear of your life, your way of life, the survival of the country. And so they've got worse things to worry about than, than computer uh, hackers, although they do have to uh, try to defend their critical networks. But if you're looking at the risks to the West, we spoke earlier a little bit about the sort of ransomware attacks and the criminal attacks. A lot of those happen out of Russia, and Russia has got both criminals and state workers who are very, very good at hacking. And maybe they don't need to do the elite level attack on a power grid or something to cause us real difficulties. Last year, Russian criminals attacked Colonial Pipeline's email systems, and that caused the company to shut down the pipeline, causing fuel shortages. Another bunch of Russian criminals who've pledged support for President Putin and his invasion last year attacked the Irish healthcare system and caused huge delays to cancer operations, antenatal services, and so forth. So where there's attacks to happen, I think there's a soft underbelly of a way of life that could be disrupted, not directly sort of fatal like a military operation but it could be seriously disruptive and that's why i think the authorities are right to sound the alarm what kind of counterattacks are being waged by the united states and others around the world at this moment well they don't say so it's hard to know and occasionally some operations get declassified but i don't think we should think that we have some magic invisible weapon that can force putin to change his mind otherwise we would have used it by now and i think if you look at it so let's take that operation against Irish healthcare, which was done by criminals for money. Um, will the United States or its allies, who have been demanding that Russia ceases hostile cyber action against critical infrastructure, would we disrupt the civilian healthcare system in Russia? Now, it's technically possible, but are we going to do things to non-competent Russian civilians that we're not prepared to do in the, in, the, in, in, in the physical world? Some of the hacktivists that are working on behalf of the Ukrainians have been doing things like disrupting a bit of media, and that has some tactical effect, but it's hard to see what strategic effect we have. I think there's an asymmetry here. We've got these highly digitized, vulnerable societies that are more digitally advanced than most of Russian uh, civilian life. So some, it's not really a case of fighting cyber with cyber. The sanctions, the diplomatic pressure, the arming the Ukrainians, those are our ways of pushing back, probably more right. than using cyber capabilities. Meantime, we are getting some headlines on the Lapsus, the group that yeah. we believe hacked Okta earlier this year, that a teenager is suspected by cyber researchers of being the mastermind behind this operation, a teenager who still lives with his mom in England. What's your take on what happened with Okta quickly and if it has any ties to the chaos going on in cyberspace as a result of the war. Well, we're moving from the fog of war to the chaos of the lapsus attack. And who knows, there's no evidence about that I've seen of any connection to the war. So let's not jump to conclusions. Actually, it's a reminder that people can cause chaos and mayhem on the internet, even if they're not connected to politically uh, motivated objectives even okay. if some of their methods are laughable. So that's a critical reminder of our vulnerabilities and the need to clean up our digital environment. Kieran Martin, Paladin Capital Group Managing Director. Really appreciate your expertise on this, Kieran. Thank you. Coming up, the Bloomberg Equality Summit convened leaders across industries to talk about concrete ways to improve equity and business. We're going to hear from Visa CEO Al Kelly next about the company's decision to suspend operations in Russia and how it's helping employees in Ukraine next. This is Bloomberg. At the Bloomberg Equality Summit, Visa Chair and CEO Al Kelly weighed in on the difficult decision to suspend operations in Russia. He also talked about how Visa is helping its employees in both Russia and Ukraine. Take a listen. We have employees in both Ukraine and Russia, so this impacted us in, in both countries. And from the beginning, our number one goal was to get as many people to safety who wanted to be. The reality is today we have about uh, 60 families, so we took care of children, in some cases mothers and fathers, uh, where we did send vans uh, through a couple of different security companies. Almost all our global security people are either in, in Hungary or, or Poland right now. And uh, we extracted people when we could. It's, it's getting harder and harder to do. 
We have about a dozen people left in Kiev. It's going to be hard to get them out at this point. Uh, most of our employees are on the, scattered along the western coast, um, hoping to stay, hoping not to have to break up their, their families. Um, you know, when I was in Poland, they, one of, that's when the, uh, the base 12 kilometers from the Polish border was bombed, and one of our employees' husband is in the army, and she had been FaceTiming him with, her, with him every day, and she went like half a day or three-quarters of a day without hearing from him. And uh, right before I left uh, Poland to head to Dubai to see our Russian employees, she grabbed me and told me that she had gotten a text from him that he was alive, which at least uh, uh, is, is good news. But it, it shows the impact this is, is having. And um, we're equally committed to our Russian employees. We ended up uh, two weeks ago shutting down or suspending our business in Russia. Not an easy decision, but... Uh, a decision that was driven by three things. One is with the sanctions, uh, it was getting increasingly difficult to operate. Number two, the reality was that uh, we, we were, you know, concerned about this unprovoked war that had been uh, put upon, thrust upon the people in, in Ukraine. And number three, we thought that for the sake of everybody, that an orderly wind down of the business where we weren't forced into it by another round of sanctions that might say, you know, immediately you have to shut down was in the best interests of everybody. And uh, we subsequently uh, made available to our Russian employees the ability to relocate. And if they relocated, we would give them a job. And in what is quite a statement, we had a town hall with them on a Sunday morning. And by that Wednesday, 70 of them and their families had already moved to Dubai. Um, and uh, today, I believe that, now I didn't get a briefing this morning, but last I knew we were somewhere in the neighborhood of about 120 employees and their families had migrated uh, to Russia. So we'll see what happens. Uh, you know, a lot of these folks are hopeful that they'll get back in weeks. I'm not sure that's going to be the case. Mm -hmm. uh, I think this is going to be a, a prolonged battle. I think Putin underestimated the the, the will and the skill of uh, the Ukrainian people. Visa CEO Al Kelly there. Well, Instagram will let users switch their feed so they can view the most recent posts first. This after years of complaints about the photo app's current ranking system that orders posts based on user behavior. In a blog post, Instagram saying it wants people to feel good about the time they spend there, giving them tools to shape their own experience. Coming up, progress on Moderna's vaccine for kids under six, but not so much against Omicron. We'll talk about the rise of health tech in the pandemic next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. Moderna says its COVID-19 vaccine produced a strong immune response in children under age six and initial results from a large final stage trial. But it showed only modest effectiveness in reducing Omicron infections. Moderna will submit this data to regulators in the U.S. and overseas as soon as possible. I want to get more on this with Bloomberg's Drew Armstrong. Drew, what are we supposed to make of this efficacy data and why has it been so hard to get this vaccine buttoned up for kids five and under? Yeah, it's a really good question. You know, I mean, so what we know from this is that you do see this modest efficacy. I think it's 43% uh, for kids um, six months to two years and 37.5% for um, kids uh, two to five, which is, you know, so-so. It's below the FDA's kind of prior stated threshold, about 50% of what they're looking for. I think, you know, there's a couple of pieces of good news when you dig deep into this. One, you know, the antibody response, that's kind of the immune system's initial defense, um, line of defense, essentially, looks similar to what you see in adults. So that's good. Um, in terms of severe outcomes, hospitalizations, deaths, it's inconclusive. And part of that is just because the trial design. I mean, those types of bad outcomes are so rare in kids, um, luckily, that you actually would have to have a truly huge trial to be able to measure them. And, you know, they did 6,700 children, I believe, in this and saw, you know, none of those severe events in either group. So you, it's just really, really hard to get the data when you're looking for events that are that rare. 
Pfizer's vaccine for kids also has had some effectiveness problems. I mean, is there something about very young children that has made this more difficult or has it not been as high a priority? Yeah, you know, you look at the hospitalization rates for um, younger children, they're around one in 100,000 um, of the population uh, at any given time. That's substantially less than adults. I mean, it's, I think it's about a, a 20th the rate uh, of adults. And so it, it's honestly, this comes down to, it, it, it seems to be less about the actual you know, vaccine itself. And really, this is more of a statistics problem where, you know, to get a result out of this, whether you're Pfizer or Moderna, you need some, you know, meaningful number of kids to get sick enough to be hospitalized um, in your placebo arm and then, you know, none in the vaccine arm. And because those events are so rare and because, you know, you're, you're doing this um, with only a few thousand kids, it becomes really hard to detect those in a way that is statistically meaningful. And so you run these trials, you see the antibody response that tells you that, hey, this looks like it works the same way it does in adults and that's good news and this should be generally true for kids. But when you're looking for that type of real world efficacy where you need need these real, really, really rare events to happen in a defined population in a limited period of time. It's just really hard to get that and then not have it be statistical noise. Um, and so I, I think that has really been the challenge. This is a trial design and stats problem. It doesn't seem to be as much um, of a uh, problem with the drugs themselves, sorry, with the vaccines themselves. But again, it's just really hard to measure. All right. Well, thanks for working through the, the complexities of all this. As a mom with kids in that age group, very anxious to see more progress here. Drew Armstrong, thank you. I want to continue the conversation now and talk about how the pandemic has impacted the healthcare landscape. I want to bring in Tara Viswanathan, Rupa Health founder and CEO, along with Talia Goldberg, partner at Bessemer Venture Partners. Partners, Rupa Health just raised $20 million in their Series A led by Bessemer. Thank you both so much for joining us. Tara, I want to talk a little bit first about what Rupa does. You focus on specialty lab tests, which, to be fair, you know, often get ignored by traditional doctors, tr traditional Western medicine. They're not covered by insurance. What is the gap that Rupa is looking to fill here? Yeah, so the gap is really, um, one piece of it is the type of lab tests that we give doctors access to. So our platform allows doctors to have access to over 3,000 different specialty lab tests. And when we say that, we're talking about DNA testing, microbiome testing, advanced hormone panels, and things like that. And so our broader mission is to make personalized root cause approach to medicine accessible and available to every person on the planet. And you know, we can talk a little bit more about the gap and how we're being treated, but what's happening on a macro level is this shift towards patients demanding more holistic and personalized care. Talia, let's talk a little bit more about that. Obviously, you know, some people are learning the hard way. They need to take uh, be their own advocates when it comes to healthcare. You know, where do you see weaknesses in the health care system and how do you see this as an opportunity to address those? I think, well, first off, thank you so much for having us on the show. It's great to yeah. be here. Um, and we're really excited to have led the Series A in Ruba because the shift that Tara just described of the shift towards root cause health and personalized care, um, there's enormous consumer demand and there's been uh, a lack of accessibility and availability for this sort of testing, some of which is newer, newer diagnostics and newer types of tests that are emerging, things like genomics, microbiome testing, um, that we're just starting to get really great data on and be able to use in a personalized and holistic manner. And as all of these specialty tests have emerged and there's growing demand and Im their importance in the landscape um, has swelled, there's been a challenge in actually accessing those tests and synthesizing uh, what the data means and how to interpret the diagnoses um, and actually taking action. And so that's where we see enormous potential for Rupa to make root cause care, just normal health care uh, that every patient and every consumer has access to. Tara, healthcare and our needs have evolved dramatically through this pandemic. I'm curious for your thoughts about where we are in this pandemic and the decision at this point to live with the virus but keep businesses, uh, for example, open, uh, even though we're not necessarily at the final end. Is that really the right call? 
that's a tough question. And I think it's um, it's tough for any one person to answer. And I think we're seeing that with the broader broader government and state by state regulations as well. I think one of the things that's been interesting in in our world and our field is actually this um, potential ep like continuing epidemic of long COVID and how we're actually going to be treating that in the day to day. Because by this point, many people have actually experienced um, experienced the disease, but they have they have not they have not been rid of all of the symptoms yet. And so one, I think, struggle we're going to have is how to actually treat all of these people who are experiencing these long COVID symptoms. Talia, how do you think about that? I mean, obviously, you know, we're in kind of a whole new world. We're going to be living with an epidemic uh, for potentially years. What does that mean from a healthcare perspective? And how is that influence where you and Bessemer are placing your bets? It's had an enormous impact on the investment landscape. One of the major changes that has happened has obviously been the adoption and acceleration of at-home testing, which plays in really well with uh, a lot of the momentum that we see with Rupa Health, um, as well as with the availability of, of telehealth and accessibility of that. And I think making, again, healthcare more affordable, more accessible, um, and more holistic, taking into account mental health, physical health, um, and, and someone's environment is is really important. And we're starting to really see the um, uh, the potential of some of the new technologies and new models of care that are emerging really on display throughout COVID. And that's what's been super exciting for us and has been behind a lot of our investments over the past two years. All very important. Um, Tara Viswanathan, Rupa Health founder and CEO, along with Talia Goldberg, a partner at Bessemer. We'll keep our eye on you both. Coming up, where Bitcoin goes from here. We're going to be speaking with Anthony Pompliano, also known as Pomp, to talk about the crypto landscape, the war on Ukraine, and what institutional adoption, adoption of cryptocurrency looks like over the next few years. More on that next. This is Bloomberg. for our crypto report with Bitcoin while staying in its range after breaking 40,000 for a bit, not going much higher or lower, staying in that tight range ever since the start of the year. Joining us now, our crypto contributor, Shanali Bostic with more. Shanali, why isn't it breaking out? Yeah, that's that's really the real question here. We are back above $42,300, but we have been about in a $15,000 range since the beginning of the year here. We have not yet hit even the highs of this year. So the big question here is, what will give Bitcoin another leg higher? One question that we will have answered by our next guest, Anthony Pompliano, from Pomp Investments. Thank you so much for joining us. What is keeping Bitcoin from breaking out this year the way it had last year? Yeah, one of the big things that uh, is very obvious with Bitcoin is that the supply demand uh, me mechanisms are very well understood. And so you can actually go ahead and check on the on-chain metrics where the supply is and how illiquid. And what we're watching is exactly what we actually saw in 2020. Uh, and then again, in the summer of 2021, right before the big run up. Uh, is that more and more long-term holders are acquiring Bitcoin. They're taking it off of exchanges. Miners are acquiring Bitcoin. They are not selling what they're mining. And so you're getting this highly illiquid supply that once a catalyst hits, regardless of what it is, whether it comes from the macro environment, whether it comes from a big buyer of Bitcoin, could be one of many, many things. Uh, that catalyst will go ahead and kind of ignite this underlying illiquid market. And I would expect to see a very big move in uh, the Bitcoin price. Now, when that happens is the big question. Will that happen in the coming weeks? Will it take months to happen? Nobody knows. But whenever we get these lulls where people are taking the supply off the market, and it's becoming highly illiquid. That's where we see those parabolic moves happen shortly afterwards. You know, I'm kind of curious not just about the liquid markets generally. I'm curious about the private markets here. You had been tweeting about the Board 8 Yacht Club, Club um, creator, Yuga Labs, raising $450 million in a seed round, a big seed round. Why do you think that the private space is garnering so much money? And what do you think about the private valuations here? I think there's two things happening. One, if you're investing in bonds, you're losing. If you're holding cash, you're losing. So people have to go to the private market. They have to push out on the risk curve. That's exactly what they're doing. The second thing is this is a generational trait. If you want to get 
asymmetric returns, you have to go and invest in Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. You have to invest in the infrastructure, you have to invest in the liquid assets. And that's what every single great investor is doing. And so the ones that are still sitting out from this market, frankly, they're just going to be left behind. And I think that uh, seeing this $450 million round is a perfect example. If you look at the Yuga Labs financials, they're mind blown. These guys are operating with a 92% margin. Their company is less than two years old and they've got nine figures of revenue. Anybody on the planet who would see those types of financial uh, metrics would be excited about investing in this type of business with this type of momentum. And so I think that there's plenty of people who point at the industry, they laugh, they don't understand it. Uh, but what I do know is that the world's wealthiest people not the future wealthiest, the world's wealthiest people today are crypto investors. And my guess is that over time, the Forbes 400 is going to be dominated by Bitcoin and crypto investors. And so if you want to be part of that, you should get into the industry. Given the prominent role that crypto is playing in the war on Ukraine and especially in providing humanitarian aid, along with President Biden's executive order, why don't you think Bitcoin has broken out in a bigger way? Well, Bitcoin's up 25% since Russia invaded Ukraine. And so ultimately, people tend to look at, since it's so volatile, it's hard to lose track of what's happened in just a matter of weeks. But it's up 25%. It's outperformed every other asset that people would look at in these types of scenarios. Uh, we just don't think about that as it's been trading in that range. And so I think that watching what has happened on uh, the Ukraine situation is a perfect example. They raised over $100 million from Bitcoin and crypto uh, investors around the world. That's more than most countries gave to Ukraine. And so when you start to see this, how did they do it? They literally just posted a wallet address on the internet, and that's just the donations directly to the government. As Alex Gladstein from the Human Rights Foundation pointed out, that doesn't even include the NGOs or any of the non-government type organizations that also got uh, those donations. And so I ultimately think that what people are waking up to is these payment rails are superior to every other payment rail in the world. Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies are good for business, and that's true for individuals, that's true for corporations, that's true for nation states. And whether we're talking about nation states like El Salvador, the United States, where the president and his administration has now said he wants to be a global leader, or we're talking about a country that is literally being invaded by a nuclear-armed adversary, every single person needs this technology, and if you don't adopt it, somebody else will, and you will be at a disadvantage. Now, to new investors, it's really Bitcoin, Ethereum, and everyone else. There are thousands of other cryptocurrencies out there. I recently spoke with Michael Saylor of MicroStrategy, the world's biggest corporate holder of Bitcoin, as far as we know, and asked if we're going to see massive consolidation in this market, how many cryptocurrencies actually exist five years from now. Take a listen to what he had to say. This is a rotation from an entrepreneurial driven industry to an institutionally driven industry. And we're sitting at this point where we're crossing the chasm. And the question is, which, in, which entrepreneurs will be institutionalized and come public? There will be a shakeout. And obviously, 6,500 cryptocurrencies are not going to be around here in a decade. What do you think the crypto industry looks like in five years? How many cryptocurrencies actually survive and, and which ones are they? Yeah, look, I, I think that he's dead on, right? Anytime you have brand new technology, you have tons of intellectual capital and financial capital flowing into an industry like this, uh, you're going to get a lot of folks who are experimenting. They're trying things. But the truth is that most of them don't last. And if we go back to the late 90s as an example, all the ideas were right, streaming music, food delivery, et cetera. But those first iterations, most of them did not work. And it took another decade before the infrastructure was in place. People understood the technologies. There was the consumer behavior uh, kind of transition. And I think the same thing is going to happen here. Now, the beauty of this is something like Bitcoin specifically as a digital currency. This is not the first attempt at, at this. For over 40 years, the cypherpunk movement has been trying to create digital currency. And finally, on iteration 8, 9, 10, whatever Bitcoin ended up being, now it is actually struck and is receiving global adoption. The same thing is likely to happen in many of these other ideas. It's just going to take a while for us to get there. So you're somebody that's moved to Miami, a place that, you know, the, the mayor has been very openly accepting cryptocurrencies in the community. To what extent, Pomp, are you seeing other cities and states truly adopt cryptocurrencies as a form of payment, as a form of ways of accepting taxes uh, and welcoming some more of the community there? Yeah, look, I think that Miami is the shining example of what freedom and leadership is in the United States today. Uh, this is the last place in the world where socialism is going to take hold. And I think that what we're watching play out here 
is a resurgence in the fact that leadership does matter. And so what Mayor Suarez has done is he has taken a city that most people, frankly, didn't even know existed outside of Miami Beach and, and kind of the South Beach tourism area, and he has revitalized it by putting a flag in the ground and basically promising one thing. I'm going to cheer for your success and do everything I can to help you be successful. And the sad part is that that is a message that is exactly 180 degree, degrees different than most people have been hearing in places like New York City or in various cities across California. And so I think that Bitcoin is a big part of that story. It's not the only part of the story. And what you're now watching is that politicians are realizing, both at the local, state, and federal level, that Bitcoin is good for their campaigns. It's good for business. I have had literally tens of different politicians who are running for various uh, positions across the political spectrum in this next election reach out. And they're leading messages, I'm pro-Bitcoin, I'm pro-crypto. But that is no longer something that makes you stand out. If you are anti these technologies, you're basically going against tens of millions of Americans where they're choosing to store their wealth. You will not get elected. And if you're anti-crypto and you're in a current seat, you will be voted out. And I think politicians are both looking at this as a carrot and a stick. It's a carrot because you'll get the support of the community if you're pro the technology, and it's a stick because if you are anti these technologies, they'll meme you to death on Twitter and they'll vote you out of office. All right, no room for interpretation there. Uh, Anthony Pompliano, Pomp, as you're known from Pomp Investments, thank you, along with Shanali Basik. Thanks, guys. Coming up, falling into line, the latest company to acquiesce to China's crackdown on technology. That is next. This is Bloomberg. Let's talk China Tech now. Tencent, the latest company in China to embrace a new paradigm of stricter government oversight. Shares of the social media and gaming giant dropped after it posted single-digit sales growth for the first time since listing in 2004. Now, Tencent saying it's time for an era of healthy growth. Our Ed Ludlow joins us now to unpack it all. That is a huge change, Ed. Yeah, it is. And there's a lot going on, right? Growth has slowed down. The advertising market is difficult. Tencent is a social media company. The gaming environment in China, very hard. The regulatory crackdown has paused licensing. But the reality is what Tencent's saying is we can no longer basically fund losses through the capital markets and to drive that high rate of growth. I mean, just look at that chart on your screen. And they're kind of acknowledging that in the environment the Chinese government have put in place, there's a new normal, which is one that they play ball in, and that it will actually help the company to be more stable, have stable, healthy growth, as you put it, M, quoting the company, but it should also help stabilize margins too. So what comes next here? Could it be other companies saying they're also in for an era of healthy growth? Yeah, I mean, Alibaba was kind of the first big of the tech giants in China to say, yep, we agree with this kind of position from the Chinese government of cracking down. Tencent followed suit. And in, in specific cases, Tencent's talking about working much more closely with the government. So, for example, one bright spot for the business is its fintech arm. And, you know, they have been known to make acquisitions. And they're talking about potentially having a separate financial holding company for that business, about working closer uh, with the Chinese government. The other half is kind of the outlook, right? The, the Chinese government's changed its tune of late and been signaling they'll be more supportive that this crackdown on their tech companies that's been going for a year could ease. So then what comes next? Well, they talk about working closely with the, the government on gaming, for example, where they have a pipeline of games ready to go, but they've not been able to bring them to market because of the licensing halt. So it's a kind of I'll play ball with the government kind of game in the best interests of future growth. And you wonder what the additional pain points are. Ed, thank you. That does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Join us tomorrow. We're going to be joined by Kathy Gao of Sapphire Ventures, along with Ross Gerber, to talk all things Disney, as well as Spencer Bogart of Blockchain Capital. And don't forget to check out our new podcast. You can find it on the terminal, of course, and with Apple, Spotify, iHeart, and wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg. Thank you.